kids podcast. <laughs> you can go slow. A kids podcast about. Hello, my name is Ari, and I help produce this show you're listening to. I wanted to take a moment to say thank you for being here with us. It means so much that you're choosing to spend your time listening to this show and hearing what we've made for you. We truly couldn't do this without you. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi there, and welcome to 1.5, a kids podcast about climate justice. I'm Olivia Greenspan. And I'm Zanaji Artis. And we believe that kids like you deserve a livable future. A livable future. This means a future where no one will have to worry if our planet is healthy enough for humans to live safe and happy lives. That's Joanna. She's our on-hand dictionary if we ever come to a word or phrase you might not know or understand already. 1.5 is a show where we explore the challenges facing our planet with scientists, youth activists, and other environmental leaders who have experienced the realities of the climate crisis firsthand. If you've been following along with 1.5, you know all about what climate change is, how we got here, and a bit about what people are doing about climate change. Today, we're transitioning away from what climate change is to focus in on the human details of the climate crisis. Let's put a magnifying glass on climate change. For the next three episodes, we'll be answering questions like, how does climate change affect us all differently and why? While we, of course, won't be able to cover all the ways climate change impacts people differently, we do hope that this handful of firsthand perspectives helps to tell the story of how climate change and environmental degradation are impacting people today, and also how this will impact people uh, who are planning for the future. We're starting with our conversation with Kevin J. Patel, founder and executive director of One Up Action, a youth-led organization empowering young leaders to turn ideas into action. Kevin is an awesome leader who Zanaji and I both have worked alongside. Today, we'll talk about what environmental racism is, what the connection is between environmental racism and climate change, and how all of these issues connect to systemic racism. I know that's a lot of new terms, but Zanaji, Joanna, and Kevin and I will be here all along the way to share this new knowledge. Let's jump in. Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin J. Patel. I'm a climate justice activist. I'm also the founder and executive director of One Up Action. I'm 20 years old. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, and I've been a part of the climate movement for over 10 years. Beautiful. Amazing. So, Kevin, we know that you do lots of different things. You've organized climate strikes. You've founded your own organization. You worked with um, Patagonia, National Geographic, all these other you know, amazing things. But we would love to hear about why addressing climate change is so important to you. Yeah, of course. Where my story begins is when I was very, very young. Um, I think I just had that ability to understand and comprehend the inequalities, the injustices that were happening in my community of South Central Los Angeles. When I was in elementary school, I was not like regular kids. I always wanted to, you know, I was in the garden, you know, wanting to plant and like grow stuff. And I was always with my dad in the garden or, you know, very much interested in nature and in plants and stuff like that. And I started advocating around that issue about food justice and really teaching my peers that we can grow our own foods, uh, that we can grow our non-GMO organic foods, and we can really do something and bring a change of becoming healthier and eating healthier. But then second semester of my sixth grade year, I was actually affected by heart palpitations and irrigo heartbeat. Joanna, can you help us out quick? What are palpitations? Palpitations. A sensation that the heart is racing, pounding, fluttering, or skipping a beat. Got it. Thanks. You know, not knowing I was sitting in class uh, and then my heart starts beating very, very fast, not feeling good. I was rushed to the hospital and ever since then, my life changed in a matter of minutes. I didn't know how a healthy boy like myself, you know, someone who was eating healthy, uh, was advocating on behalf of uh, food justice can just all of a sudden get heart palpitations and having my heart rate go up to two to 300 beats per minute. And so it was very scary at the moment until I learned, you know, and did my own research that 
air pollution and smog pollution actually causes heart palpitations and irregular heartbeat. And South Central Los Angeles and Los Angeles in general was being ravaged by air and smog pollution. And ever since then, I've been advocating on behalf of the not only my, my community, but the planet. And I needed to step up and use my voice. So there's a term that's commonly used when talking about areas or communities with limited access to nutrient-rich foods, and those are called food deserts. As Kevin describes, people living outside of food deserts have greater access to high-quality foods. They have access to a lot more healthier foods, non-GMO, organic, vegan options and whatnot. So it's the access to good quality food, right? And the inability to access that. Food deserts are geographic areas where access to affordable, healthy food options, aka fresh fruits and veggies, is limited or non-existent because grocery stores are too far away or run a food driver outside at your, you know, your local grocery store. There's no access to affordable, healthy food options within my community. When the lack of access to affordable, healthy food, as Kevin describes, afflicts mostly people of color in a certain region or community, we call this environmental racism. Environmental racism is a concept and in the environmental justice movement, which developed in the United States uh, throughout the 1970s and 1980s. The term is used to describe environmental injustice that occurs within a racialized context, both in practice and in policy. And that's the actual definition of environmental racism. So when we're talking about environmental injustice or environmental racism, we look at how, um, for instance, my community of South Central Los Angeles doesn't have, we're literally a concrete jungle. A lot of, you know, a lot of affluent communities have more access to nature or hiking and have access to these green spaces. While when you're coming into South Central Los Angeles or any neighboring community that is not affluent, we don't really have that access to green spaces or hiking trails or trees within our communities. Environmental racism is not just happening in my community, it's happening throughout the world globally. Thank you. And I actually just, I want to come back to uh, something that you said, and you described it as concrete jungle. And I, so I grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in the woods. And so a lot of kids listening to this right now, they may have also grown up in places where they were surrounded by nature. And I'm wondering if you can describe that a bit more. What is this concrete jungle and what is the imagery that comes to mind? What does it feel like to live in that space? Of course, the the poor, you know, the poor air quality, the the smog pollution, the air pollution. Um, being in this space, living in this community, you don't see enough trees, right? Every street that you walk, you might see one or two trees, but a lot of it, a lot of it's paved with concrete. And what what I meant by concrete jungle is that there is no technically there's no green spaces where communities can go and enjoy themselves. And that's what I meant by concrete jungle because there aren't, there aren't enough uh, green spaces. I also just want to go back to environmental racism, if you don't mind. So I want to talk about the oil industry, you know, the fossil fuel industry, who is literally in our own backyards, you know, extracting oil and extruding and releasing toxic chemicals and, you know, driving up the air and smog pollution. And when you go into these communities, you can smell the chemicals, you can smell the toxins. And this is what our communities have to live by because we don't have enough the, enough funding or enough money to fight back. Because again, we're living, we're not, we're, we're not earning enough money to fight that, you know, these industries, we have to raise our families as well. Right. And so that's environmental injustice right there. That's environmental racism right there, where our communities, they target our communities because they know that we're not able to fight back because they know that we don't have the resources to fight back and uh, we're not able to do anything. So they extract and they extract all these resources from our communities while not, you know, kind of solving the issues that are coming out of being extractive, right? And that leads us to not only being a community that is a concrete jungle, but that leaves us to being a sacrifice zone as well. And uh, and that's the, and, and both in practice and policy of environmental racism, what a sacrifice zone is, is that these industries and these corporations and the political power that is, you know, in charge of these areas is extracting all the resources out, but not putting anything back into that community. And so we're left with injustices. 
racism itself is a very complex topic that affects pe- many different people in many different ways. When it comes to the exposure to poor air quality and water quality, right? When it comes to the, dr- the water that we drink uh, and the air that we breathe, right? Black, indigenous people of color uh, are disproportionately impacted. And that's because, you know, no one's fighting for our communities. There are not resources going into our communities. More from Kevin J. Patel when we return after this quick break. Hi, I'm Nikita Simpson. And I'm Dr. Lockhart. I wrote a kid's book called A Kid's Book About Emotions. And I help kids and grown-ups work through their emotions. This is Everyday Feels, a podcast about emotions for kids and their grown-ups. I think it's so great when you have a person that you trust in your life that you feel open and able to share everything that's going on inside of you. I agree, Nikita, because I think it takes so much confidence and bravery in sharing our stories and being vulnerable because we're trying to normalize talking about feelings and emotions. That means that we all have them and it's okay to talk about them because we all feel them. And you're always allowed to feel what you feel. Let's continue this journey together. This is Everyday Feels, a podcast about emotions for kids and their grownups. Hi, my name is Leo Abelo Perry, and I'm the host of The Activators, a kid's podcast about activism. On this podcast, we want to celebrate and amplify kids who are activating social change by doing what they love. We'll talk and learn from other kids who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. We'll learn about different issues that need our attention. Things like gender equality, environmental justice, and food insecurity. And we'll hear some advice from kids, for kids, on how we can make a real difference in our world. So... To every kid who's listening right now, no matter if you're already an activator or you're just getting started, get up and do your superhero pose. All right, you ready? On three, we're all going to say activators in our superhero pose. One, two, three, activators! Welcome back to 1.5, a kid's podcast about climate justice. Let's return to our interview with climate activist Kevin J. Patel and why he's fighting for marginalized communities in the climate justice movement. If I were to talk to a 10-year-old right now, I would say, you know, I think it's our communities that are being the most impacted, you know, um, people of color. And it's the design of the system of these oppressive systems that are not made for people of color. And that's the reason why we're fighting to make sure that these systems work for everyone. And many kids already notice the difference of like when they go into their communities to see the inequalities and disparities of like, what is their community being offered? Are their communities being offered fresh food? Is there good water, drinking water? Like when they turn on the faucet, is it brown? Is the water brown or is it water clear, right? And then we're, you know, I'm sure many kids have gone with their parents to more affluent communities and they've seen these big houses, fresher foods, these exuberant stories with like big signs saying organic vegan options and whatnot right while they're going back to their communities and they don't see any of that they don't see the big malls they don't see any of the 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 stuff that they see at um other community that other communities have so i'm sure that's another example of like environmental racism right there you know i think the the way that we visualize things and we put that into context of like, oh, wow, are my community is actually being impacted by environmental racism. That's a very powerful prompt for kids listening. Like, you know, what does your water look like when you turn it on? What does your street look like? Does it have trees on it? What does your grocery store look like? Do you have a grocery store near you that has fresh fruits and vegetables? You know, on one level, I'm pointing out how complex it is. But on another, it's not very hard to understand. It's not very hard to understand. Also, are you more near uh, fast food restaurants or are you near good, you know, a grocery store that actually has more healthier options and that are affordable for you and your family? Access meaning both is it physically close to you and access meaning can you afford it? Can you pay for it? 
It's like a good distinction. We're going to go to the main industry and the corporation that is causing the climate crisis, the warming of the planet. The fossil industry is responsible for the climate crisis. And how they're connected is that when we're taking a look at the fossil fuel industry and where they're extracting the gases and the, the, the fuels and the oil, where they're extracting them in uh, low-income communities, marginalized communities, communities that are filled with Black, Indigenous, people of color. And the reason why they're doing that is because they know that we don't have the resources, nor do we have the, the will to you know, kind of fight back against these industries or at least they think that we don't, right? Uh, because we definitely are fighting back. But we don't have the resources. When I, what I mean by that, we don't have the money to fight back. And so that's the reason why they're doing this. And so that's where environmental racism comes in, is, is that you know we just don't have the resources, nor do we have the response to um, fight back against these interests. And that's the reason why they've been able to get away with extracting in our communities for quite a long time and causing all of this destruction to our communities. They've caused all of these injustices. They've caused all of these disparities within our communities. And when Kevin mentions disparities within communities, he's not speaking vaguely. He's drawing from experiences he's witnessed firsthand. We have to look at the root causes of these injustices, the root causes of these disparities. Olivia, you tied it together. It's like, yeah, is because our communities are not able to fight back. That's the reason why these destructive industries are in our backyards, right? And just for an example of a real life situation that actually happened here in Southern California is where, you know, affluent communities members in um, Beverly Hills and upwards, there was actually an oil drill there. They concealed it though within a building so that these affluent communities don't know that there's oil drilling happening in their communities. Once the community started finding out, they actually sued and got the oil drill to be removed from their community because they knew that it would cause toxic waste. You you would be able to smell the toxic air and be able to smell the chemicals and whatnot in the air as well. So I don't know if you guys seen them, but they're huge drills or even smaller drills in these concealed little boxes and kind of make them with like, you know, some props or whatnot uh, so that no one knows that what's actually going inside, right? Or what's happening inside. So it's definitely interesting to see how this community found out (laughs) that there was oil drill hidden in their community and they fought back and they closed it down. And then all of a sudden you're seeing how, you know, our communities, they're all in the open because they know that we're just not able to fight back. The fossil fuel industry literally goes in and says, uses these tactics of like, okay, let's hide this from this community because they know that they can, they have the resources and the man, you know, the the person power, uh, the people power, uh, and just the money to fight back against their industries, and we don't. So they don't, they don't do that extra business here. This next part that Kevin says. You may want to mark it down so you can return to it when you need to hear it most. We need everyone in this movement to continue not only fighting for justice, but continue fighting for the people on the planet. Uh, And that's what really matters is that no one's ever too young, no one's ever too old to get involved and do something to make change, to make an impact within their community and within the world. You're such a powerful leader who does what all great leaders do, which is brings up other leaders with them. And I've seen that firsthand with Unup Action, how you give other young people leadership opportunities in the climate movement uh, so that they feel, you know, they're able to, to grow their confidence. Being a leader doesn't mean that you're leading people. It means you're bringing along people to make change. And you can't do that alone, right? There can't only be one person. It, can't, it has to be multitudes of people who are coming together to make change. And those are the leaders of Not tomorrow, but of today. Kevin, thank you so much for being here. I mean, you've really done it all. You're an inspiration to Olivia and I, and you're doing so much amazing work. Thank you so much for having me. You guys inspire me to continue. So thank you guys so much for being that light in my, you know, in my life to continue to fight. So thank you guys so much. Okay, that is a wrap on our conversation with activist Kevin J. Patel. How awesome was that? Now that we've learned all about environmental justice, 
Guess what time it is? Let me guess. It's game time. (laughs) Okay, listeners, this is that awesome time to reflect on what you heard and what we heard on the show today. Okay, Sanaji, you're up first. Question one, what is environmental racism? Okay, so this is a tough one. It's also one that could be defined in a lot of different ways. But from our conversation with Kevin, I would say that environmental racism is environmental injustice that occurs within a racialized context. And for example, many communities of color have less access to green spaces and have poor air quality, more affluent or places that have more money, and mostly white communities. Environmental racism is a type of racism specific to environmental damages society inflicts on people of color more often and more harshly than white people. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that answer. Follow-up question for you. Uh, When you talk about environmental racism in the world, um, what are some common reactions that you get from people? I, I think that a common reaction is really just this idea that Uh, a lot of people don't know that it's happening and that it is a part of this larger system where no specific individual has done something that has caused uh, environmental racism to happen in a specific community, but that the reality is that Black, Brown, and Indigenous people are disproportionately impacted regardless of whether individuals have caused it because it is this larger system that's built into the fabric of society. Mm. That makes a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here's a question for you, Olivia. What is the connection between environmental racism and climate change? Okay. The connection between environmental racism and climate change. So there are definitely some areas of overlap between environmental racism and climate change. And Kevin definitely spoke about some of these connections. And if it's okay with you, I'm also going to touch on some key differences So like Kevin discussed, fossil fuel companies extract gas and oil, uh, fossil fuels, from primarily low-income and marginalized communities. So remember that Kevin talked about those uh, oil wells in Los Angeles that are hidden in buildings. That was something brand new that I learned from Kevin. And we will have a link to examples of those disguised oil wells uh, in our show notes. So to summarize what, what we talked about today with Kevin, Marginalized communities experience both the negative impacts of fossil fuel extraction, uh, so think about you know polluted water and air, um, as well as worse impacts uh, from the climate change that those fossil fuels cause. Environmental racism encompasses more types of environmental harms than just those caused by climate change, but they do have many areas of overlap. Okay, very good. So you're saying that... They experience the the impacts from the source where it is. So the drilling and and the the dirty water and the air from all the pollution from that. And then later, when it causes climate change, they also are impacted disproportionately. That is that is what I'm saying. Yeah. Thank you for summarizing that for me. Thanks for helping me out. Okay. Next question and final question for you, Zanaji. How does climate change intersect? not with environmental racism, but with systemic racism. Okay, so a lot of environmental racism is caused by systemic racism or a history of racism that's been built into the structure of our society over many years. And we're talking about like hundreds of years here and also in other places around the world. And because of the many overlapping disadvantages caused by systemic racism, Black, Brown, and Indigenous people on average are more vulnerable to the negative impacts of climate change, whereas white people tend to have more types of protections and security. So that could be money, it could be better infrastructure, access to health care, ability to work remotely, all these different protections that are uh, afforded to white people because of the system that we have. And a great intro to learn more about this is a kid's book about systemic racism. And it is a perfect intro to talking about this and learning more and continuing the conversation. Thanks, Anaji. Yes, you know, as you can see from our conversation, it's okay to not always 
know the perfect words or um, be able to understand everything perfectly. The important part is to talk about it. Um, And with that, that is all for our Climate Justice Game Show today. Be sure to share some of what you learned today with someone else. Like we've said, talking about climate change is a major way to help make change happen. Yes, keep talking about climate change and environmental racism. And if someone asks you a tough question that you're not sure how to answer, send it over to us. We would love to answer all of your questions and we'll share an email that you can use for all of those burning questions. Thank you listeners for joining us today. And thanks to Kevin J. Patel for sharing his personal experiences with environmental racism and how he's standing up for marginalized youth in the climate movement through his organization, One Up Action. You can find more about Kevin's activism by visiting oneupaction.org. We'll also have a link in our show notes. 1.5 is written by me, Zanaji Artis. And me, Olivia Greenspan. With occasional support from me, Joanna, from naturalreaders.com. Our show is edited and produced by Matthew Winner, with help from Ari Mathay and the team at Sound On Studios. Our executive producer is Jelani Memory. And this show was brought to you by A Kid's Podcast About. This show is inspired by our book, A Kid's Book About Climate Change, and the millions of young people around the world fighting for their right to a livable future. You can write to us at listen at akidspodcastabout.com. Share all those burning questions with us. And you can check out other podcasts made for kids just like you by visiting akidsco.com. Hi, this is Matthew, and I'm head of podcast at A Kid's Company About. We hope you enjoyed this show, and we'd love for you to check out our growing library of shows at A Kid's Podcast About. Whether you're looking for storytelling with crafts and activities, fact-finding with experts and enthusiasts, or looking to explore and understand your world better, we have got a podcast for you. Check out the A Kid's Podcast About channel on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found, or visit akidsco.com. (laughs) 